Hey, welcome. This is uh, Dr. David Tien um, in Singapore. Uh, you can find me at AsianRake.com. That's AsianRake.com or AuraDating.com or A-U-R-A-Dating.com. And I'm joined by uh, Darren, DJ Fuji, all the way over in California. And you're in California right now, right? Yeah, yeah, California. All right, it's my great pleasure to do this because um, I've been a big fan of his uh, work and with his uh, blog, with uh, he posts some really amazing stuff up there too. And uh, we recently uh, met up just what was it like a few months ago, and uh, it was it was a real joy uh, seeing the face behind all the great um, content I was reading. And uh, one of the the best things about his work and, and himself is that he really cares a lot. Like it's something that I, you can't hide, and it just comes through. And it really um, impressed me. Uh, Darren, if, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. my name is Darren. Um, I go by DJ Fuji in our industry. And um, yeah, I mean, I come from a, a very similar background as a lot of guys getting into this. And so uh, that gives me kind of a unique perspective in that I, I know what the guys are going through. Um, I'm pretty much the shortest dating coach in the industry. Actually, I am the shortest dating coach in the industry. Uh, there's one other guy who's Who's shorter than me, but he's just a speaker. He's wait, not a. Wait, wait, he doesn't how, coach how short are you? I'm five foot four. Oh damn! What were you? Yeah, were you wearing some? Uh, man, you, you didn't look that short when we met. Oh, uh, I, mean, I was wearing shoes. I but... can't believe I'm actually disappointed that I'm short for once. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I know. No, I'm. I'm literally the shortest guy. Um, I'm shorter than JT. Uh, I'm shorter than Style. I'm shorter than uh, like literally. Yeah. I have yet to meet a single coach who's <laughs> who's as short as uh, me, which is. Kind of funny because the rest of my life that wasn't a, a thing to be proud of, but uh, right. in this industry, it uh, it's it's interesting because a lot of guys will come and they'll be like, you know, uh, how does that work being you know shorter and everything, and um, you know, it's it's kind of a unique yeah. perspective because I can tell you firsthand, you know, the well, there's not really any advantages <laughs> really inherent in that, but there are definitely things that you can work around. There's things that um, that you need to know when you're doing that that maybe a guy who's you know six foot tall just has never experienced. Um, so that kind of gives me that perspective, and of course, you know, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese. Um, I have a lot of the similar cultural backgrounds, and you know, I didn't grow up popular. I didn't grow up extroverted. I'm, I'm still very introverted, and um, so I got into coaching after you know this this journey that I went through, and it's been an extremely rewarding journey, and that's why I do what I do. Right. So you're, um, I'm still a little bit um, surprised that you're so short. So you were <laughs> in um, the military, is that right? You were for I was the Marines. Yeah, you're in the Marine Corps. Okay, cool. You're the, like the third guy that in the past two weeks I've been meeting um, who's in the Marine Corps. Do you have to learn any new skills as a, as a shorter uh, Marine? Um, not really. I mean, I was, I was a varsity wrestler before oh, the Marines. Yeah. And then yeah. before that, I had done... I was a black belt. I had trained for like ten uh, years before that. So, wow. it, it, how old were you when you when you uh, got your black belt, or when you were training? Um, was this in your teenage years? Yeah, from like six to like wow, 15, cool. sixteen. Cool, and then cool. from there, I transitioned from um, from karate into uh, ground fighting, into wrestling, and so I did that for four <laughs> years. And nice. so, like, the Marines was kind of a a logical step for me, kind of a logical and kind of mm. not because. You know, I had the family saying, you know, you got to go to school and you got to, you know, do the Ivy League thing and, you know, do what all your friends are doing. And mm. we have to be able to tell our uh, our friends that our grandson is going to this school. And uh, I, I had a lot of both worlds involved in that. Yeah. Wow. What an interesting background. So tell us how you got into coaching. How did you get out of this, um, in, out of your dating situation and into success? Uh, well, I started as a student, as a bad student. Too. Mm -hmm. um, I, my whole life, I had always been trying to compensate. That's really what got me into fighting. Is I was trying to compensate for um, really a lack of social skills, a lack of game, a lack of just I didn't know how to be attractive to women. And uh, so my whole life, I kind of spent, especially you know from you know seventh grade on, thinking, okay, well I got to do something because these guys are popular and I'm not. And that's mm -hmm. I've never had a girl like me. I've never had a girlfriend, you know, and, and you start to notice that in seventh and eighth grade because there's dances and nobody wants to dance with you. And I remember very distinctly, uh, one of the big turning points was in eighth grade, I finally mustered up the courage to ask this one girl to dance. And it's, you know, this is, uh, I was in a school, we had about 17% Asians. So it was enough to make us clicky, which is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all hanging out with Asians. And I, I go and I go up to this, this Asian girl, this Korean girl, and I ask her to dance. And I figured, okay, worst case scenario, she could say no. 
Well, I kind of miscalculated that because the worst case scenario was she screamed running into the bathroom so I couldn't chase after her. <laughs> wow. And uh, yeah, this kind of miscalculated that one. And uh, that was the first like, you know, kind of signal that, uh, you know, you're not really popular and cool and you should probably do something about it. And of course, there was, we didn't have these resources, so uh, we didn't have the internet or anything. So what I was supposed to do with it, I decided, you know, when I get into high school, I'm going to be an athlete. That's just, you know, I'd, I'd already been in martial arts, but clearly that didn't help. So maybe, maybe if I was wearing a varsity le- a jacket, you know, maybe that would, that, would, that would do it. So when I got to high school, that's when I started wrestling. Mm-hmm. And I, my goal was to, to get a varsity jacket before everyone else did. So my sophomore year, I lettered varsity. And I would wear that thing in any weather. Like, <laughs> you'd be 100 degrees outside and I'd be wearing a letterman jacket. And uh, when it happened, I remember thinking, like, this is when everything's going to change. And nothing happened. Like, it was the same thing it's always been. Mm-hmm. And um, then so I figured, okay, that's a fluke in the matrix. And so when I graduated, uh, you know, I was going to the Marines. And I thought, well, this is going to take care of me. You know, I'm going to be a Marine. I'm going to have the uniform. I'm going to have the reputation. That's going to take care of it. So I got to the Marines and nothing changed. <laughs> and uh, so every step of the way, I'm like, something's got, you know, this has got to work. And, and every step of the way, nothing changed. Um, when I got out of the Marines, I thought, oh, it's because I don't have money. And so I went out and I got a, a tech job, an IT job, a high paying tech job. And I bought a sports car and a house. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, now I got the money. And so girls are going to like me. And nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that right around that time is when I kind of stumbled across this, and it the as soon as I found it, I just started uh, just completely just devoting myself to this, mm-hmm. uh, just because it it represented this this idea that you didn't have to settle for whatever you were born with, that mm-hmm. if you weren't born with these skills, that you could develop them, and this was you know in two thousand four two thousand five, really before the game had come out. It was just very, very underground. It was very creepy, to be honest, mm. uh, because it's like hypnosis and all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> right. It was, it was like now we can even the playing field. You know, all these popular kids that had it this whole time. Now we can do something about it. And that was my my big like epiphany, thinking, okay, now I can, I can do something about it. And of course, it was a little bit more difficult than you know all of the websites you know claimed. But uh, I didn't really have a choice. You know, I tried everything else and nothing was working. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to do this and uh, or die trying. And I devoted everything I had to that. And I, and I basically put everything else on the back burner to make this happen. And mm-hmm. there were a lot of sweat and tears that went into that journey, as, as I'm sure you know. And um, eventually I started to, you know, after, after years of this, I started to, you know, get results and get consistent. And then I started, I was recruited to be a coach. And I was working in IT at the time. And eventually, I gave up the IT job to be a coach full time. And then, you know, shortly after that, I started my own business. And then, then I was running the business and, and coaching as well. So that's just kind of okay. how it culminated in me being here. Nice. I, I noticed that a lot of the accomplishments in your life were motivated by uh, trying to get girls. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's it's one of those. I mean, just reading this book, um, "The Mating Mind," uh, uh-huh. you know, Jeffrey Miller and. Um, the thesis is, and he's a, he's a pretty well-known uh, psychologist in, the, in academia, that um, the great accomplishments in, the hu- in human civilization were um, because men uh, and their genes were propelling them to, and com- compelling them to do these great things for, to impress women, basically, to, to further their mating um, strategies and their mating uh, power. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's, it's an idea that permeates most of psychology in, in, in that the things that we're driven to do, you know, the testosterone in our 20s is, uh, you know, is so that we, we make our mark on the world, so that we mm-hmm. have influence and our drive for power is uh, all of that really comes down to really attracting a mate and then supposedly attracting, genetically attracting uh, a superior mate than we would have gotten otherwise. Yeah, I mean, like you were doing the the varsity lettering in in sophomore year for everybody else, mm-hmm. and then you right. did really well get, getting this job and everything. So now moving out of IT and going into coaching was that? Did you take a big uh, pay cut? Oh, I took a huge pay cut. Okay, <laughs> it's right. like a massive so pay cut. What was the thinking behind that? Because a lot of guys in Singapore and in Asia um, don't don't have much understanding of the whole how this whole industry developed. They just sort of they just started coming to this the past couple of years. Um, So it's not really like a uh, career decision um, that's open to them at the moment. And I think it's really, there's there's a lot of curiosity behind that. So what what motivated you to do it? 
Uh, it's the same thing that, that keeps me going now because, you know, we work for long hours and I, I work harder than I ever have in IT. Uh, but what keeps me going, what, what drives me in that and keeps me going in this job is that it's so incredibly rewarding uh, to see that transformation that I made in other people and, and give guys that hope that I once didn't have and that I had eventually acquired. And um, when I started, you know, coaching, it was it was so different than computers because I'm very introverted. And as I kind of was going through my journey, I started to you know start to pick up extroverted traits, and I started to realize that I don't like sitting in front of the computer all day long for a job. Now it's mm-hmm. it's fine if I'm you know relaxing or doing whatever, watching a movie or playing games or whatever. But I don't like to do this day in and day out and crunching numbers and code and everything else. And I mean, I still like computers. I've always been in computers, and I still, to this day, I'm on computers. But it's, I don't like that to be my, my main thing. I don't like to have to do that, and, um, which is ironic because now I spend all kinds of time in front of the computer doing websites <laughs> and everything else. But, but uh, it's for a different purpose because mm-hmm. when you're writing code, the purpose is just to appease some head honcho who's making money off of that. Whereas uh, what we're doing now, in, in addition to obviously working in field with guys, you see that transition. You see that transformation and in computers, you'll never open the mail one day and open it up and uh, have a wedding invitation with plane tickets saying, I would be honored to, if you would fly mm-hmm. to Germany to attend my wedding because without you, this wouldn't have happened. And you don't get that in computers. You don't get that in, in marketing. You don't get that in, in, in the, the industries that I was working in. And I started to realize that this, is, uh, this was my calling and, and this is – uh, I made a difference doing this. Like if I died the next day, no one would really care in computers mm-hmm. except that we have to hire a new programmer, right? I, mm-hmm. I wasn't making that difference. And that's really what drew me. Uh, the, the girl thing was definitely an influence, but what drew me to uh, things like martial arts and the Marines and that stuff, uh, especially after I had been in it a while, was kind of that always sense of, of improving myself and making a difference. And in the Marine Corps, I was a sergeant and I was in charge of 70 guys and you know, there was a definitely a mentorship thing, and in wrestling it was the same deal, in martial arts it was the same deal, and I I always felt like when I got pulled away to computers, as much as I liked it, I was getting kind of distracted from my purpose, from my calling, because I was being driven by the Almighty Dollar, and that's really what happened. Mm-hmm. And when I kind of came back to that, I kind of I got this feeling of kind of coming home, coming back to my 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 calling, my purpose, and that's when I realized, okay, this is what I want to do. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I had to make that same career decision about just going into this full time or not. And I was coaching a lot on the side, but what, um, you know, I was a university professor. And as a teacher, I did have direct communication and contact with the students, and I'm supposedly influencing and making their lives better. But, you know, anyone who's been in university knows that if you take somebody's class, probably you'll forget everything after the exam. You know, and right. I knew that the chances of my actually making a major difference in these kids' lives was very small. And, mm-hmm. uh, but when I worked with a guy, every single coaching client I had, I knew I made a huge difference in his life. And just like, like what you were saying, when you get a wedding invitations or like Flickr photos of, of, the, of the guy with his, with his baby in the hospital, you know, the newborn right. baby, that, like, that's a really tangible sign of something that you've done that you've had direct influence over. And that was what really drove me to make that decision in the end. Um, yeah, absolutely. When you figured out that you could learn how to get better with women, that that's actually a skill that you could learn. How did you get from there to becoming a coach? Like, what, what were the, some of the turning points in your development? Like, you, we were talking about, like, it takes years and so on. Uh, yeah, the blood, the sweat, and the tears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, even now when I coach Marines, and um, they're, like, one of my favorite types of clients mm-hmm. to coach because I, they're so easy to coach. Mm-hmm. But uh, even now, it's it's still funny to me, even though I understand it, that I'll coach Marines that have been through uh, battle. They've been through war. They've dodged bullets, and they will run through a hail of bullets to save a buddy. But I tell them to approach a woman, and they just look at me like I'm crazy, right? And it's it's funny to me, despite the fact that I know exactly what that's like. And that was kind of how it was for God for the first two or three years. It was it was just this constant battle, and it was it was battling your own uh, you know self discipline or lack thereof, um, and going out every weekend. And uh, it took me seven months to get any kind of tangible results. Uh, to where I had any kind of sexual relationship, it took me seven months of. Uh, you know, getting blown out and getting rejected, essentially five, six nights a week, 
uh, it got so bad that I was um, I was sleeping at work uh, because work was closer to the ve- the venues that I was at, and I was sleeping at work uh, because I I lived too far away. So in order to go out five six nights a week, I would bring my clothes and I would sleep at work, and then I'd go to the gym in the morning to shower, and, and afterward Wait, I could just go. How up. long did you keep that up for? Uh, like almost a year. Wow! Did anyone at work notice? No, because I would nice. I would. By the time I got back from the venues, it was to the clubs, it was like 1 o'clock, right? And 1 or 2 in the morning, and then I'd sleep till like 6, 7 before anyone came in. Um, I would crawl out from under my you're desk. Like, wow, and... you're so punctual. You're always the first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you're wearing the same clothes you wore last night. <laughs> yeah. You just live for uh, this job, man. Yeah. I, it's funny. I actually had a – in my truck, I had a stack of clothes that I would bring on Mondays, and uh, I would just go out every night. And, wow. uh, but that was kind of the sacrifice that I was wanting to yeah, make to get good at this. that's man. And um, it was, I'm going to use that was, story when, when the guys complain that they got to go out on a Wednesday night. Or, yeah. You know, it's like, come on, man. You, you haven't done this before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that was, that was what my life was like for a good – Three, four years, it was just nonstop, constant. And, you know, sometimes I wonder even on coaching whether uh, maybe it was meant to be that I came into a time when we didn't really know anything as coaches, whereas the industry was so new that we were kind of still stuck in that bubble of, you know, maybe we could hypnotize girls into liking us. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I play devil's advocate and think, you know, maybe for us, that was, we're, we're, for our generation, maybe that was the right way to play it. Maybe it was like, it was good to be, uh, to not have any re- sense of reality in terms of what we were doing. And maybe we just had the pipe dream that we were chasing. And uh, because that's exactly what it was. It was, it was, we had to have 100% faith that this is going to work. Yeah. And, the difficult thing was that in 2004, nobody was good already. So you had guys on the internet that like a couple guys claimed to be good, but they were six and a half feet tall magicians. <laughs> and it was like you had no uh, – even JT wasn't really around much back then. And so you just had no idea that this was even possible, especially for a short Asian guy. And we just had to take it on faith that yeah. you know, kind of the, the pioneers that, oh, we could just do this and hope that it works. And um, so it, just, it was kind of just – just blatant sweat equity and just, right. just going at it day in and day out hoping that uh, you know you never really knew when you were going to get good. It was a, there was no you know path blazed by other people. So it was like maybe I'll get good tomorrow, maybe next week, <laughs> right. or maybe never. So know? that's an interesting point. Like back in – so in 04, 05, there wasn't um, – there wasn't the book yet, the game. Um, there, yeah. You were just following this on the ASF or whatever online forums. Right. So how yeah. did you keep your motivation up? Like if you're saying that you you didn't have any a ceiling on your expectations, which is awesome. But then how did you know that? How where did you get that faith that it was going to work out? On some level, I realized there wasn't another option. Like oh, there was no plan B. Nice. I tried okay. all the other plans. It was this or nothing. It's like you know. Try this or die. Try it, you know. And mm. uh, there wasn't any plan B. There was no contingency. So this had to work. And I wanted to believe it would work because, you know, I I bought into this this idea that you could do it. And we'd have, you know, I remember having those lapses of faith, thinking like, you know, maybe we're just deluding ourselves. Maybe this is just all mental masturbation. Maybe mm. like no one can get good at this. And we're just, oh, yeah. you know, I I remember being into astral projection when I was when I was little. Not like the the new wave like woo woo astral projection but like hardcore like real <laughs> like scientific astral projection right and I remember being into it and I lost faith after a while because nobody could prove they could do it mm-hmm. and no one could do it on command it was just this like this fantasy of and even today it's like this fantasy of like well it might exist but no one can prove they could do it and I lost a lot of faith in that process because and I bought all the books and but nobody could end up doing it and um and you know I, I remember the loss of faith periodically in this where I was like maybe we're just deluding ourselves maybe it doesn't exist mm-hmm. and I had to come back to it and one of the things that I remember really solidifying that for me in terms of uh you know kind of solidifying that faith is looking back and say okay from a rational point of view this might be completely like in the matrix it might be complete bs mm-hmm. but if that were true that would mean that I would see no progress, and which is really difficult in the first six months because I didn't see any tangible progress. But what I did is I said, okay, look back three months and look back one month. Uh, look back three months and look back, look back all the way to the beginning, right, for another six months ago. Mm-hmm. Was I any different three and six months ago? 
Were there any differences in my behaviors and in what I could do? Even if it was small, were there any differences? Because if it wasn't working at all, you'd see no difference. So even though my sample size is really small, I should see some progress if this was working, and I should see zero progress if it wasn't. And I would look back three and six months, and I'd realize, wow, there is a big difference. Now, I don't notice you know, a, a lot of it because there's nothing really tangible in the sense that like, I don't have a girlfriend, right? But what I can do now versus six months ago and the mindsets I have now for six months ago is huge. And I think that constant process of looking back three, six, nine, maybe 12 months back, you, you start to realize, especially when you're going out that much, you've grown a lot. Maybe you haven't, you don't have that million dollars yet, but you can see the progression and you can see the process. And when you see that process, you start to realize it's no longer a matter of if, it's now a matter of when. And I still don't know when, but because I'm seeing that progress, I know it's a matter of time. Right, right. Okay, so you're looking at the progress that you've made in the past that has motivated you to keep going forward, that this, that there's some hope, there's that, that light at the end of the tunnel, because you can right. still see it. Um, right. That's awesome. So there's, there's a t um, an idea in, um, that, I, that I teach in my coaching in Singapore, where a lot of guys, I'm actually hitting um, some mainstream uh, audience in Singapore, where we're getting guys who don't know anything about the game, and they think, hey, I need to get better at dating. So they kind of come into this without the, with the wrong set of expectations. So they're thinking, it's just like, I just buy the DVD set, and then I never have to worry about it again. Um, when they don't realize that actually this is sort of like like a self discipline for the emotions, right? That um, it's going to be you're going to go through some really hard times, and that's what growing is about. Um, and there, I find the guys who slow down on their progress and might even drop out for a little bit before coming back later is because they, they like you're saying, they they have they don't have the the pain associated with with not succeeding. Like they have an escape plan. Like when you were saying, well, I have no choice. I, I kind of have to stick with this because otherwise uh, there's no, no other options for me. And that was my situation too. Like I was either going to be sitting in my dorm room eating cup noodles, you know, right. for the rest of my life alone, or I'm going to have to figure something out. So even if this isn't it, I'm going to have to figure something out. And right. um, so I, you know, one of the things I try to encourage guys to do is to burn bridges and have no escape plan in terms of your social life. That like you can't go back to those the three dudes you always hang out with and play Left 4 Dead with. You know, you yeah. can't go back to your comfort zone or back to mom and dad's place and just hang out there and say, well, if, if I don't have a girlfriend, at least I got mom and dad for the rest of my life. Because right. they, they need to have that pain to push them in a way. Mm -hmm. but Absolutely. What, yeah, I mean, like, one of those great ways of doing it is just to look back and see the progress. And sometimes, you know what I noticed? Is sometimes the progress isn't the sort of progress that they were expecting. Like, they don't have a girlfriend or anything, but hey, look, now you can walk into a club without feeling really nervous. You know, that wasn't something yeah. you expected, but, you know, now you're not, like, just hiding behind a beer in your chest or something, you know? And yeah. um, there's this great book called uh, The Good, Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's a management book. And he's mm -hmm. got this um, concept at the end called the flywheel, where great companies start off, it's sort of like taking a gigantic several-ton disc that's sitting, you know, that's being propped up by a, by a stick, basically, and you're trying to spin it like a flywheel. Right. And the first thousand revolutions of this thing are incredibly difficult because it's just so heavy. But once you yeah. get it going, it's like you can't stop it. it then it mm -hmm. becomes incredibly hard to stop. But that first part where you're trying to get this flywheel moving is the difficult part. Now, as long as it's moving forward, or as long as it's going in the right direction, you're, you can see there's progress. So a lot of, a lot of uh, what we're having to do is just to show Look, you know what the end goal is. You're going to get this girlfriend or maybe a threesome or whatever it is. But along the way, there are these little waypoints that you can track. And yeah. um, that's just one thing that we can, we can help guys to see. Um, so what, what about – I'm stealing that analogy, by the way. The flywheel? <laughs> I'm stealing that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's calling